We're going to be picking up right after the glycocalyx in the chapter three notes in this video. Um, so where we're at is draw and label one phospholipid. So here's what you're doodling. It's a ball with two little tails that are going on. Now we talked about phospholipids the first time when we were hitting on our organic molecules. So this is a modified triglyceride where one of the fatty acid tails, that's these things, triglycerides have three of them, one of them gets replaced by a phosphate and that has a charge to it. And so this ends up being a molecule that both likes water on the head where the phosphate is, because phosphate is a charged molecule. And then we have these fatty acid tails that are nonpolar covalent, and so they're hydrophobic. So this molecule, again, both likes water and hates water in different arrangements. Now, if you were to take just a bucket of phospholipids and pour it into water, they would arrange themselves very specifically. So this is one layer. A plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer, so it's going to be two layers of them. So this is just part of one layer. Here's how the other layer would end up arranging itself. So the fatty acid tails would line up with each other because the fatty parts like the fatty parts and they want to hang out next to each other. The water-loving parts would face the outside of the cell where there's water, otherwise known as extracellular fluid or interstitial fluid. No, I said inter yeah, no, interstitial is right now. <laughs> or we would have them on the inside of the cell facing the cytosol inside of the cell. So this is inside the membrane that's outside the cell that's inside the cell. Okay, next you have what are some of the functions for proteins that are embedded within the phospholipid bilayer. Um, you can see the phospholipid right here. Um, this is one of the proteins, here's another one. All these proteins do a bazillion different things in the plasma membrane. So that means the plasma membrane has way more functions than just it protects the cell. So the proteins are very often going to be transport proteins that help materials, solutes, get in or out of the cell. So that's what this one's showing you. Some of the other proteins will, act, um, will serve as enzymes, so they will catalyze chemical reactions. Some of the other ones are receptors. Now when it says signal transduction, that means relay of a signal from one side of the cell membrane to the other. This is one of the ways that hormones work. So the hormone is going to bind to the receptor and then make something happen inside the cell as a result of that binding. Next, intercellular joining means we can connect one cell to another. So in this case, the proteins essentially glue themselves to each other. Cell-to-cell -cell recognition. So here we have a glycoprotein, and here we have a receptor for a different cell. This one happens to have a shape that matches the glyco part of this glycoprotein. And since it matches, that's how this cell recognizes that this cell belongs to you. And this is actually very important for how your immune system is going to function. Then not all of your cells are actually connected to each other. Some are connected to stuff outside the cells. Connective tissue is really good at this. So sometimes the proteins are going to connect a cell to the extracellular matrix instead of to another cell. So all of those are some of the various functions that the plasma membrane have, specifically the proteins in the plasma membrane have those functions. Next, we're going to talk about three different ways that cells can essentially be glued together. Tight junctions. I always make the analogy that these are like zippers. So if you take a zipper and you zip it up, you very tightly bond two pieces of material together. That's how this works, only we're going to zip these two cells together, and as a result of zipping them together, material's not going to be able to get in between those cells. We are tightly bonding those cells to each other, so any place where we want a really good barrier, we're going to tend to hold the cells together with tight junctions. These are um, fairly expensive connections to make between cells, so you really only want to make them where you absolutely need them. Desmosomes are a little bit cheaper from an energy standpoint for your cells to make, and my analogy here is these work more like buttons. Um, if you take the buttons on a shirt, you know, you can stick your hand between those buttons, so you can let materials pass between the cells, but at the place where there's a button, the material's held together pretty well. So it still glues the cells together, it's just not as tight a junction as a tight junction actually does. So we are going to be letting some material through, but it's still a pretty strong way to hold them together. Um, most of your cells are held together with desmosomes because it is cheap, but it is still strong. Gap junctions are a more specialized type of junction between cells. The glue that's going to hold them together actually creates a channel that connects the two cells together, sort of like an elevator shaft. So this means if something happens inside this cell, 
it can relay a signal through that elevator channel, if you want to look at it that way, to the next cell. And so these cells can communicate with each other. This is the all important word for a gap junction is communication. We are going to start talking about tissues in the next chapter and cardiac muscle or heart muscle, as I put it on here, those cells are held together with gap junctions. And that is critically important for the functioning of the heart. Next, what is interstitial fluid? Well, it's the same thing as extracellular fluid. It's really just the fluid between the cells. When we start looking at tissue slides, this is one of the slides that you're going to be looking at, and it happens to be the tissue I was just talking about. This is what cardiac muscle looks like under the microscope. And it looks like there's just all this space in between the cells, but in the real world, that space would be filled with this interstitial fluid. Those cells have to get nutrients through that fluid. They have to get respiratory gases through that fluid. They have to get rid of waste into that fluid. And so this fluid is not just filler. It's again, very important for the functioning of the cells that it happens to go in between. Now your plasma membrane is selectively permeable. What that means is some things can get through the membrane. Some things can't. All of this ties back to the chemistry stuff that quite frankly most of my students usually try to forget right after we've done the chemistry test but don't do that you need to still remember specifically covalent and ionic bonding and within covalent bonding you need to remember nonpolar and polar molecular weight is also going to matter here the way that the plasma membrane tends to be set up because the membrane is mostly phospholipid bilayer and most of the phospholipid bilayer is the fatty acid tail. So I'm going to go ahead and come to this. So notice most of that membrane is actually this nonpolar fatty acid tail part of the phospholipid. That means the majority of the phospholipid bilayer is going to be nonpolar. So anything that is small and nonpolar is going to be able to get through that membrane and not have any problems doing that. But things that are polar or ionic, in other words, they have a little bit of an electrical charge to them, they are going to be repelled by the nonpolar part of this membrane, and they're not going to be allowed to pass through. So this, again, ties straight back to chemistry. Now, I'm hoping eventually we'll unfreeze and we'll be able to go back to campus. And one of the things that I like to do to help you guys understand this is a dialysis bag experiment. A dialysis bag, if you've never heard of dialysis, it's a process that people who are suffering from kidney disease have to go through. And you put these special membranes in there and then the membrane filters blood for you because the kidneys aren't working anymore. So this membrane works just like a plasma membrane. It is selectively permeable, just like your membranes are selectively permeable. And I would really like you to see how that stuff works. So hopefully we'll get to do an activity rela uh, relative to that. Now, Passive versus active, when we're talking about our body, this is about energy expenditure or not. If a process is passive, it means you don't have to spend any energy to do it. If a process is active, you do have to spend energy to do it. Now we're about to start talking about things like diffusion and osmosis. These are topics that are covered a lot in middle school and high school, and people can usually spout back a definition, but they don't really understand what it means. Diffusion and osmosis are both passive processes that are going to allow materials to move in and out of the cell depending on the chemistry of those molecules. Active processes, though, you're going to have to have proteins, and those proteins are going to have to help things get across, and in the process, those proteins are going to have to spend energy to make that happen. Simple diffusion is the movement of a solute from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. If you were to just take let's say some food coloring and put one drop of food coloring in the water and then walk away from the cup. When you come back in 10 minutes, that food coloring is going to be dispersed all throughout the container. That's diffusion. You don't have to stir to make that happen. The particles want to get as far away from each other as possible. So they're going to spread out all on their own and try to make the concentration equal all throughout the cup. So that droplet is going to spread out. And again, no energy is required to make that happen. It just happens because the particles, the solutes in this case, want to move. Facilitated diffusion is similar. So I'm going to actually back up for just a second. Simple diffusion is also specifically going to be the movement, that diffusion that we were just talking about, but through the phospholipid bilayer. Facilitated diffusion is still that same movement, but you have to have a membrane and that membrane has to have a protein in order to do facilitated diffusion. So if you were to put food coloring in and it just passed right through here, that would be simple diffusion. 
But if you put food coloring in and it couldn't get through unless there were a protein, but the protein can be an open door to allow it to get through, that's facilitated diffusion. This is still not spinning energy. It's sort of like just having a door that's open. An open door is not spinning any energy in order to be open, but it is allowing things to get in and out of a particular door frame. And so that's facilitated diffusion. Carriers and channels are going to tend to be sort of similar. They're going to be proteins and they're going to allow things to either move in or out of the cell. I sort of like to make the analogy that a channel is an always open door versus a carrier is sort of like a revolving door. So what happens here is it's open to one side. The extracellular fluid is what it's trying to tell you here in this picture. It's going to pick up one of these solute particles, plop it right in here, and then close on this side and open on the other and then spit the particle out in the intracellular fluid, which is the cytosol. And so it opens to one side and then flips and opens to the other side. So this would be a carrier protein versus this is a channel that's just always open. Both of these can do either passive or active. Channels tend to be more passive. Carriers tend to be more active, but that honestly all depends on whether or not ATP is being spent. Osmosis is um, specifically going to be the movement of water through a selectively permeable membrane. This is again where I really want to be able to do an experiment in class with you guys, but here's what I want you to imagine. We have this dialysis membrane that is moving halfway through here. We've got water, which is, I'm going to call that purple, in the background through here, and then we have this solute, let's call that whatever, a starch molecule right here. Well, starch is a huge molecule. Um, molecular weight is over 100,000. It's a gigantic molecule. So because it's so big, it's not going to be able to pass through this phospholipid bilayer. Water, on the other hand, its molecular weight is 18. It's a tiny molecule. So it is going to be able to pass. So any place there's a solute in here, that's a place where there's not water. So that means technically there's more water on side B off over here it wants to try to be equal on both sides. So the water is going to osmose through the phospho, or well, not in this case, phospholipid bilayer, through the membrane in this case, and try to dilute the starch that's on this side. So the water would actually increase in height on this side and decrease on this side as it moves through that membrane. So again, hopefully we're going to get to do an experiment that relates to this to really help you understand the process. Aquaporins are just channel proteins that help water get in and out of a cell, depending on what the cell needs to do right now. Osmolarity, we sort of talked about in an earlier chapter when we were talking about concentrations of fluids. So osmolarity is that same basic premise. So if you have a very concentrated solution, it's going to have a high osmolarity. If you have a very dilute solution, it's going to have a really low osmolarity. Hydrostatic pressure is the pressure of water within a system. So what would happen earlier based on what we described, remember that the water was going to actually move through that membrane and increase the volume of water on this side and decrease it off over here? Well, it can't do that forever. Eventually, gravity is trying to push that water back down too, and so it's going to reach a point where it just can't keep coming onto this side because there's already too much force against it. That's the hydrostatic pressure, and that's going to be counteracting the osmosis in this particular setup. Um pretty much already said that part, so just go ahead and get that defined off in your notes. Okay, next up, tonicity. This is going to be a description of how a fluid is going to either allow water into a cell or make water escape a cell, or it'll just be at equilibrium within the cell. We're going to have three different options when it comes to tonicity. We're going to have the three words that are down here at the bottom of this picture, hypotonic, isotonic, hypertonic. This is one of those times where I really hope that you guys have been studying your Latin roots because that can help you out. So tonic is referring back to tonicity. Hypo means less than or under. Iso means the same. Hyper means above or excessive. And so this is trying to tell you this is a more concentrated solution than what was inside the cell. This is the same concentration as what was inside the cell, and this is less concentrated than what was inside the cell. Oh, I thought I had a thing to draw, but I'm going to do it on this slide. Just ignore the question that's sitting up there. Um, I gave you guys a little table in the notes to draw out what's happening in each one of those situations, and so that's what we're going to do. And I don't have this version of the notes with me, so forgive me if I don't do it in the same order of what's in the notes. We're going to start with hypertonic. 
Hypertonic again means more concentrated. So we have a cell with a nucleus. It has some solutes. Each one of those dots is a solute. Solutes can, oh, that handwriting is atrocious on the computer, but solute can be anything that's dissolved in water. Remember that from the chemistry chapter. So that could be like oxygen gas, a nutrient, a waste, a hormone. It can be any number of things. But if we put a cell into a hypertonic environment, that means the environment has more solutes in it than the cell actually is going to have. Now, here's what you got to remember. If there's a solute, that solute is taking up the place where water could have existed. So there's actually less water here than there is here. So water is going to leave that cell and the cell is going to shrink. I'm going to try to write neat, or at least legibly. That process is called crenation. And that's what can happen to one of our cells if you put it into a hypertonic environment. I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. Okay, next. I'll actually switch colors because I like colors. I'm such a color nerd. If you guys were to see my notes from college, you would see that. Okay, this time we're going to do isotonic. So isotonic means same concentration. So we're going to have our cell. It's going to have some solutes in it. I still want a nucleus in there. Give me a nucleus. Um, and this time, there's going to be the solution outside is going to have the same number of solutes as what's inside the cell. So since this has the same concentration inside as outside, that means there's going to be no net movement of water. In other words, water is going to go in just as fast as it's going to go out. So the cell will not change. That triangle means delta. Delta means change, so no change. Cell doesn't get bigger. It doesn't get smaller. It's already at equilibrium, or using one of our fancy words from chapter one, it's at homeostasis already. All right, last option. I'm feeling green. Last option is going to be hypotonic. We're going to take our cell. Oh, no, I ran off the edge. It's going to have some solutes in it and a nucleus, if I can draw my nucleus. This time, though, we're putting it into a solution that has fewer solutes in it. So what's going to happen is there's more water outside the cell. It's going to diffuse, again, really osmos into the cell. The cell is going to swell. Now, here's a problem. Humans are animals. Animal cells don't have a cell wall. Cell walls provide rigidity, and we don't have that. We have a membrane, which is a liquid. That means if we put our cells into a very hypotonic environment, the cell can possibly burst. The fancy word for a cell bursting is called lysing, L-Y-S-I-N-G. But basically, it means that cell exploded and died. Okay. So now let's relate this to things that you may have heard about, hopefully over time. Let's say that you get stranded out at sea and you're in a nice little floating raft trying to not die. The water around you in the ocean is hypertonic to your cells. Hopefully you have heard many times, don't drink ocean water. Well, it's, it's not just because you might end up with a bacterial infection. It's because that water is hypertonic to your GI system and to your bloodstream. If you drink it, it's going to suck all the water out of the cells lining your gastrointestinal cavities and from your bloodstream as well. So what it's going to do by sucking all that water out of your cells is it's going to give you horrible, runny, watery diarrhea until you become so dehydrated that your kidneys fail and then you die. So that's why you don't want to drink ocean water. It's because it's hypertonic to your cells. You instead want to drink hypotonic solution because that's going to allow you to absorb water from what you're drinking. Um, now, there's a difference between tonicity in your GI system and your bloodstream. So you can drink hypotonic water, and in fact you should, because that's the healthiest thing for you in that case, but we should never hook you up to an IV of pure water because that would be hypotonic to your blood cells. Instead, anytime they give you IV fluids, they're giving you an isotonic solution of what's often just called normal saline or lactated ringers. It has a bazillion different names. 
but that fluid is isotonic to your red blood cells and your white blood cells for that matter, so that those cells won't explode or shrivel up and die. So all this tonicity stuff relates to you all day, every day. You just don't have to think about it all the time. Okay, next up, we're coming back to active transport. Like I said earlier, you do have to spend energy in order to move anything via active transport. You are also going to need a protein to help things get in or out, depending on which way you want to move it when you're doing active transport. One of the other things about active transport that I didn't say earlier is that active transport very often moves things against their concentration gradient. Everything we've been talking about up to this point, simple diffusion, uh, facilitated diffusion, osmosis, those all worked with the concentration gradients. This usually goes the opposite direction. So you have to work harder to make it move. Okay, one of the examples of active transport involves something called the sodium potassium pump. And yeah, this is a silly gift, but it shows you exactly what the sodium potassium pump does. So these sort of peach lines, that's your phospholipid bilayer. Notice it's moving two specific ions, sodium ions, which are the red balls, and then potassium ions, which are the pink balls, and they've labeled outside the cell versus inside the cell up here at the top. Also, importantly, they're mentioning an ATP has to be spent in order to make all of this stuff happen. So here's the first thing you need to know about the sodium potassium pump. It moves three sodium ions to the outside of the cell, and then two potassium ions to the inside of the cell. So you can see that happening as this gift runs through several times. But I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the picture that's in your book now. So it picks up three sodium ions from inside the cell, rotates around, spins an ATP, and then spits those sodium ions out to the outside of the cell. So all it's done is it picked them up from in here and then spit them out out, out there. So it ejected sodium ions. While it's open to the outside, it picks up two potassium ions, gets rid of the phosphate from the ATP earlier, and then swivels again to drop those two potassium ions off to the inside of the cell. So it's three sodiums out for every two potassiums in. Now, this does two things for us, and so I'm going to do a doodle again. Imagine that that is your plasma membrane. This is going to be outside. Come on. And this is going to be inside. As this works its way through, we did three positive ions to the outside of the cell, the sodiums, and then two positive potassium ions to the inside of the cell with just one cycle. That means we have an unequal charge. Where there are more positives, we are going to have a positive charge. So that means the outside of most of our cells ends up being positive relative to the inside. That relativity means the inside of the cell ends up being slightly negative relative to the outside. Now, there's usually a question here about, but aren't these potassium ions positive? Yes, they are, but there are fewer of them. So because there's more sodiums out, we still end up being more positive outside, and we have to be the opposite inside, so we've got to be more negative inside. This charge imbalance that exists right through here, this is called resting membrane potential, and it is a straight-up voltage across your cell membrane. We also have this chemical gradient because we have a bunch of sodiums outside the cell and a bunch of potassiums inside the cell, so those two ions can diffuse based on their own concentration gradient. So this creates what's known as an electrochemical gradient. It's critically important for muscle and nerve, but really most of your cells have this charge across the membrane. I don't remember if it's your textbook or a different one, but it mentions that about half of the calories that you consume every day go to powering this pump. So this pump is really important, and yet it's one that most people don't even know exists. But when we talk about like your thyroid hormone elevating your metabolism, one of the ways that it does that is by making you make more sodium potassium pumps so you have to spend more energy so you produce more heat. All right. There's one more way that you can get things in or out, and this is a way for you to get really big things in or out of the cell. So when I say really big things, this would be like that starch molecule I mentioned earlier that weighed over 100,000 AMU. This could also be a way to get like whole bacterial cells into your cells, which bacteria hijack the system and they get in all the time. Viruses, same thing. But things that can't fit through a protein, like another protein, we can still get them in or out of the cell. We just have to do it with vesicular transport. 
Vesicular just means vesicle. A vesicle is just a bubble. So most of your cell's contents are moved around in these little bubbles called vesicles. They're really just, think of them as packaging boxes. So that's what's happening there. Okay, so there's two ways that we can do this basically. We can spit stuff out or we can bring stuff in. Spitting stuff out is called exocytosis. So as you watch this GIF run through a couple of times, we have a bubble inside the cell. The bubble merges with the plasma membrane and then whatever was in that bubble gets spit out to the outside of the cell. That's what exocytosis is. So depending on what's in the contents of that, you can sort of think of this like it's cellular pooping. If you have a white blood cell, eat a bacterium, then your white blood cell will actually essentially poop out the remains of that bacterium after it gets digested through the process of exocytosis. Next, a lot of your hormones are secreted this way. Um, a, a lot of other chemicals that your body makes end up being secreted this way. So I do also want you to know that exocytosis is also called secretion. That's S-E-C-R-E-T-I-O-N. The opposite of exocytosis is endocytosis. And again, if you watch the GIF move through a couple times, you'll see what's happening. This time, we pick stuff up from outside the cell wrap it up in a bubble and bring it inside the cell. So this is how the cell can intake larger molecules. There are three ways we can do endocytosis, and the names basically try to tell you what we're doing. Phagocytosis is critically important for your health and well-being. I'm going to say critically important a lot, apparently, but phagocytosis means cellular eating. This is how your white blood cells eat bacteria, which is actually what's happening in that picture. That yellow snot-looking stuff is actually a cell called a macrophage, which is one of your types of white blood cells. And it's eating some random bacillus. That could be E. coli or salmonella or who knows. It's some random bacillus. And so what it does is it throws out extensions, uses those extensions to wrap around the bacterial cell, and then bring the bacteria into its cell body, and then digest it like the pit of tarmac from Star Wars, if you want to look at it that way. So phagocytosis is a very important function of your immune system, although other cells can do this too. Pinocytosis is very similar, only we're bringing in liquids instead of solids, so pinocytosis is cell drinking. Receptor-mediated endocytosis just is a picky way to bring in what's coming in. So the cell has to have these little receptors, which are these Y-shaped proteins, if some molecule can bind to that receptor, this cell is going to go ahead and bring in whatever attached in the bubble. Incidentally, this is how most viruses get into your cells. Um, if you've been doing any reading or research about COVID, the way the SARS-CoV-2 virus gets into your cells is the spike protein on the SARS-CoV-2 virus attaches to a receptor protein that's called ACE which is an enzyme that's present in a lot of your cell membranes. And then that tricks your cell and to go ahead and inviting SARS-CoV-2 into your cell. And now you have a COVID infection as a result. So unfortunately, this was a way for your cells to be picky about what came in. But viruses have found a way to sort of fake a key and trick your body into opening the door, even though it wasn't supposed to be able to get in. Now, this side. Earlier, I'm going to actually back up for just a second. I showed you this picture of a macrophage eating bacteria. Well, this is another white blood cell. Um, I believe this is a neutrophil. It's kind of hard to tell when it's not stained, but if you stain it, the cell dies. It's chasing around these little dots. Those little dots are some random diplococcus, um, like gonorrhea or whatever. Um, but it's chasing it around, and then once it catches it, it engulfs the bacteria. So this is phagocytosis but in movable form, just so you can see what it looks like. And I also just like to show you guys that video because I want you to understand that process is happening all day, every day. You're getting bacteria from your large intestine and your bloodstream, and your white blood cells are keeping them in check by eating them exactly like that. When you get an actual infection and you show symptoms, what that means is your white blood cells aren't keeping up with the bacterial growth, and so the bacteria are starting to win but you're always having your cells run around and eat stuff that aren't supposed to be there. So phagocytosis is really important. Okay, so what types of things can diffuse through all on their very own? Kind of said this earlier, but I did want you to make sure you have it in your notes. They gotta be small molecules. Um, small can vary depending on so many different factors, but definitely sm smaller than starch, 
larger than water can still go ahead and get in them. Nonpolar substances, that goes back to nonpolar covalent bonds. We can't have any kind of charge. We can't have ions getting through. We can't have polar molecules getting through. But as it turns out, those respiratory gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, those are small nonpolar substances and they diffuse all on their own. You don't have to work to move those from your lungs to your blood or from your blood to your tissues, which thank God we would all die if we had to wait for that stuff to move if it didn't move through all by itself. Um, what can the plasma membrane block or prevent from entering? Basically the opposite of what I just said. So really large molecules, anything that is polar, anything that is ionic, again, anything with a charge, essentially, it's going to have trouble getting through too. Water would have a lot more trouble getting into your cell left to its own, but you have so many aquaporins scattered all over your plasma membranes that water's allowed its own bypass, even though it is a polar molecule. All right, so hopefully that helps you understand how things get in and out of a cell. I hope you guys are staying warm and safe.